and welcome back to another episode of Coffee with the Critters, where I live stream every Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. Eastern, unless otherwise noted. Um, those other times will be due to having on special guests or traveling for events. For those that may be new, welcome. My name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We're an international educational center where we empower animals all over the world and the people that care for them. We do that through our live streaming services, which you can find on our website. Um, there you'll see our services, our memberships. So we have online programs um, where I live stream my work with different animals. People have questions or concerns, I jump on and do a live stream for them. Uh, we have different levels. Um, also, if you're new, uh, my focus is on using applied behavior analysis with animals that is using BF Skinner's laws of behavior. So we don't have to force an animal to do anything. I was just talking to somebody about this yesterday. We even teach animals to, um, accept or voluntarily and willingly want to interact and engage with us for behaviors we need them to do um, that is good for their future and their well-being. So animals thrive in our care, not just survive. Um, you can also find out our events where we have workshops on location at the Animal Behavior Center, or if we're giving workshops other places, or if we're having online events as well. Um, those that follow the work that I do receive our weekly email newsletter where I always put in some type of information about animal behavior, behavior modification, training and enrichment. I've also started being active in my blog again and plan on sitting down and writing more on this this afternoon. Um, and you can also contact me directly. You can find, you can reach me um, either on our website or on our Facebook page. You're always welcome to email me at Lara, L-A-R-A, at the Animal Behavior Center .com. Um, So today's um, episode is a Q&A. So if you have um, any questions on animal behavior, training, or enrichment, uh, feel free to ask them to me today, and I will do my best to answer them. Um, and as we get started, I wanted to bring on uh, an update on somebody I had helped in, I don't know if it was the last Q&A or if it was the Q&A before that, uh, Beth Steptoe. Good morning, everybody. Hey, Adrian and Ray and Pat and Lynn, Bettina, Peggy. Good morning, everybody. Happy St. Patrick's Day. So in a past episode of Coffee with the Critters on the Q&A, Beth Steptoe, there she is. Um, I messaged her this morning saying, hey, I'm going to be sharing your update. Do you remember Beth asking about uh, her tortoise? I think his, her, his, her name was, is Donna Shello. <laughs> um her tortoise is blind due to an illness and she was having problems trying to get the tortoise to eat food. She was syringe training it. And what else did you say, Beth? You were um, hand feeding and syringe training because she couldn't figure out how to get the tortoise to find food on its own. Um, and I do believe I mentioned to make a certain noise each time you're getting ready to deliver the syringe feeding formula to the tortoise. This is called a conditioned reinforcer. And that sound should not change, especially in the beginning while shaping. Um, so you're pairing um, 
a reinforcer, the food in this instance, with the sound. Do that consistently, make that sound very consistent. And through that pairing, the animal will learn this is what's getting ready to happen. So the antecedent is um, the clicking sound and the behavior is the delivery of the food. Do you guys remember this? Um, Beth has got in touch with me shortly after, I want to say a week to two weeks after, saying that she was, I think it was about a week after, saying that she was making the clicking sound with her tongue and then delivering the reinforcer. Um, and she said, it's worked great. I clicked my tongue at him to feed and now he clicks to me when he's hungry. That's fabulous. That's fa absolutely fabulous. And then she reached out to me again saying he, she's no longer having the um, syringe train the, for the delivery of the food. And now he clicks his beak when he is hungry. Um, so that worked out great and makes me very, that is the reinforcer behind why I do what I do. Not only do I want to see animals thrive, I want to see the people who are caring for them being extremely empowered through knowledge and the desired behaviors they see from their animals thriving in their care. That is my primary goal behind why I do what I do. Good morning, Kim. Good morning, Robin. Hello. Um, welcome and happy St. Patrick's Day. So if anybody has any questions, go ahead and post them. Otherwise, I'm going to talk about some of the training that I'm doing. A lot of times people dread the winter. I crave the winter, number one, because I love snow. Number two, because I get to spend more time with the animals in my care. I do believe we currently have 22 animals in our care at the Animal Behavior Center. Um, that is a wide variety of range of birds, um, three American alligators, two timber wolves, um, two ring-tailed lemurs, possibly a third. <laughs> this does not include the two dogs I have at home. Um, but if you don't have any questions, I'm going to give you an update on the training that I'm doing and why I'm doing this. Uh, so I'll start off with uh, Bruce, the American alligator. <clears throat> He's been, we've been working with him for over a year. Um, he was donated or surrendered to us from the Humane Society because he was found at a very small, he was really small when we first got him. He was found in a local waterway here in Ohio and we brought him in. Wasn't sure what we were going to do with him, but he needed a place to live, survive, thrive. So I did reach out to Critchlow Alligator Sanctuary in Michigan, they were willing to take him, but with the 200 alligators they already have. <laughs> um, and so I just said, well, let me start working with him. Let's see what happens. And if you were to take him, what can I do for you to help him become an ambassador? She did request that, he, I think, I can't remember that was a year ago that he be scale trained and crate trained for transport. Uh, because a lot of times, obviously up here in the Midwest, Northern Midwest, we have very cold winters and the alligators can't stay outside. So we have to transport them from outdoor exhibits to indoor exhibits. Um, I didn't know she was going to take him on educational programs. So as it stands now, we are just going to keep Bruce until somebody else can give him a better home than what we can. So we have brought him into the center. He's housed in his pool is about anywhere from 71 to 76 degrees. This prevents him from going into 
um, brumation, which is like a hibernation for reptiles. Um, our other two gators, which are eight feet long, are in brumation. We stopped feeding them in October. We probably won't feed them again until May. Um, so there is no training happening with those two. But because he's kept, Bruce is kept in a warmer temperature, we do need to keep training him. We train him for 100% of his daily diet. And we keep track of that um, every day. Um, it, which could be anywhere from 38, 35 grams of food to 70 grams of food per day. And his primary diet is a variety of meats, um, primarily rats and mice. And in order to train him for those rats or mice, we do have to cut it up. And we cut it up into about five gram pieces so we can get repetition out of a training session. A training session lasts uh, about one to two minutes, um, and we're able to feed him his daily diet. We soon, right now, we're feeding him just one time per day. As the weather gets warmer, which it's not, we just went from 70 degrees last week to today it's going to be, I think, 38. Um, once it starts getting consistently warmer, we will start um, dividing that food in half training him twice a day so we can get twice as many training sessions. Um, okay. What? Oh, you guys are talking amongst yourselves. Sorry. I see Jayhawk saying I used ABA to teach a cat to do an obstacle course. My professor told me I was going to fail my project because of the unpredictable personality of a cat, but I succeeded. That was 35 years ago. That's great. Jayhawk. Um, and one of the staff at the center, um, has a bachelor's in applied behavior analysis. And I know one of her professors said, why would you even contemplate doing this with animals? It's not going to work. Hmm. And I said, has she heard of the animal behavior center? <laughs> um, we're doing just fine. Um, and also Jayhawk, when somebody tells me an animal's unpredictable, I just had this conversation with somebody the other day as well. When somebody tells me the animal behaves unpredictably, it's more than likely because it's being interacted with irregularly and unpredictable. And I always tell people, if you're nervous about a situation, stop what you're doing, um, because you don't have enough information yet to, um, to move forward fluently and predictably. Um, and we get that through training because training is communication. Um, teaching is information. Information is communication that is shared. It's not just about me doing the training that gator is that animals training me as well. We're working at as a team and this training is a line of communication between one animal and the other, and I am the other. Um, I do let animals train me as well. <clears throat> so back with Bruce, um, I would label him as fearful, curious, but fearful, very observant. He's always watching. And I was just telling somebody the other day about gators. <clears throat> I learned about training alligators through sitting down and training them or standing up and training them or kneeling in front of them and training them. Um, I've learned by myself um, how they see, um, how their line of vision is, what makes them nervous. Um, I can see curiosity, eagerness. I know they recognize my voice. I know they know when it's me standing in front of them versus somebody else. They're very observant about their surroundings. Um, and I see it with Elvis and Priscilla. If I take somebody else other than myself into their enclosure, they will just sit and watch and they don't move because I have not shaped the behavior of other people coming into their enclosure. Boink. When I see that, I know, note to self, this needs training. Um, Robin says, training is a conversation that flows and changes as you listen. 
Yes, I love that. Changes as you listen and observe. Um, so with Bruce, I always think, and I was just talking about this yesterday with an online consultation we had in our advanced level membership when we were talking about a wide variety of animals from wild animals that are in rehab um, to parrots. <clears throat> um, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> um, oh, well, I forgot what I was going to say, but it'll come to me. Uh, oh, I knew I was going to say, we were talking about behavior modification plans. And I had mentioned um, when I put together a behavior modification plan, I will put a huge paragraph describing the end goal of this behavior modification plan, otherwise known as a behavior change plan. And then I'll dissect that in between because no matter what I think I want to happen or how it happens, it's going to change. So I do write down what the end goal is, and then I'll dissect that in between and shape. Um, good morning, Jen. Happy birthday. And, and shape um, progress, tweak changes. Um, I'm going to end this with talking about a particular behavior modification plan. So my end goal with Bruce is I just want him to be comfortable. That's it. I don't need him to do rock star amazing things. I just want him to be comfortable, not be nervous around people. If he continues to be nervous around people, hey, Emily, good morning. <laughs> I'll see you in about an hour and a half. Um, I want him to be comfortable and thrive in his environment. I want him to grow as big as he wants to grow. We will continue to modify his enclosure to accommodate that. But what will make that easier is if he followed a nose target, which he's doing rock solid. We've got him opening his mouth on cue. And what's really cool is, so I'm bringing him out of his enclosure. You see his enclosure behind him with the door open. How am I going to get him to turn around and go back? I'm going to get him to turn around and go back through that target, um, which we've made a couple of mistakes, but we've modified it and corrected it to this point. Um, because when I get him to turn around, he does not like having his back on me or anybody. So when his back is on me, I freeze. I do not move because I don't want to be that unpredictable event in his environment um, until well, I never want to be an unpredictable event. But I will and have start shaping my moving behind him because when he's when his head is faced away from me, I am in his blind spot and I can tell because he turns to look and I'm like, I'm not moving. I'm not talking. I'm not doing anything. You have control over me, Bruce. And it's made a difference. I see he turns his back on me for longer periods of time and I'm able to start moving behind him while he's going back into his enclosure. But what's really, so he's opening his mouth on cue. We shape that with a target and with the verbal cue, which is just open. Um, when I, go to start training him. I say the same thing. So he knows it's me and it's, are you ready, Bruce? That's what I always say. I always, I tend to say that to every animal. Um, that's my cue that I give them to see if there's a, there will be a reaction, but what is that reaction? And is that reaction eager or reluctant? That's why I always say, are you ready, Rico? Are you ready puzzles? Are you ready whatever the animal? Um, that's my cue to, to gauge their reaction, to see what I need to do next. Um, but what's really cool when I'm, so he's out, now I need him to go back. So I'll turn the target stick and he turns his nose, his mouth to follow it. And I'll say open and he opens his mouth. And as soon as I say the word good, boom, he comes back his head turns back to me. So this tells me he clearly understands the target. He clearly understands open mouth on cue. And when he hears that bridge, that is a conditioned reinforcer to tell him 
you're not going to get the food in front of the target stick because I'm standing behind it. So he clearly knows my position and where that food come from, comes from. And it clears me clearly tells me he understands that behavior. Um, Jen said, I would like to add a comment. Once you slice up your training plan to get your training goal, if it's not working out, you're having a hitch in your training plan. You might have to slice the slices smaller as you try to figure where the animal is struggling. Exactly. Where the animal is struggling and how we may better be able to set the environment up for success. So never get frustrated if your training plan doesn't go as planned because that's called life. <laughs> um, you constantly are tweaking, making modifications to that plan and making sure it's moving forward. Don't ever hesitate or admit that you make mistakes. I make mistakes. I make sure I learn from them. Whoops, that didn't go as planned. Totally didn't see that coming. And this is when it's great to, Robin and I were talking the other week about recording yourself training um, because you can go back and watch that mistake and then watch what happened right before that mistake. And you'll that's the antecedent right before the the behavior that you didn't want to see. So you can look for those cues from the animal in the future instead of keep moving forward with it, stop. Because now you know the behavior you didn't want is getting ready to happen. Um, so we're kind of at a standstill with Bruce right now because when the hornbills see Bruce come out, they vocalize and it's making Bruce nervous. So the hornbills are getting ready to get moved outside and we're going to do other things inside his enclosure and just right outside his immediate enclosure till the hornbills get outside. Then we're opening up this room to Bruce and we're opening up even more for Bruce. So stay tuned. You're getting ready to see a lot of construction getting ready to happen at the Animal Behavior Center and it starts this week. Um, here's another behavior modification plan, um, that I have been putting into place. I've been documenting every single step of the way. This is with the Timberwolves, Fiona, Fiona and Smokey Joe. They have, um, this is an auto heated auto water and Fiona is showing signs of being nervous of anything new, anything, the wind blows she shows signs of being cautious. So we could step in and do more um, training exercises with her shaping change and showing her that change, she doesn't have to be nervous with change. Um, so when I see behaviors like this, I look at enrichment, what enrichment is going in and how we can use enrichment to empower the animal we always, our goal behind enrichment is always to empower the animal. So we're starting to shape changing enrichment um, that she's eagerly engaging with. So she's nervous. I've been watching her. I've been told she's nervous of this heated or this, yeah, auto water. And what happens when the water, when they drink the water and it gets so low, um, there's like a weight underneath the water dish. And if it gets so empty, the auto water turns on. That's what makes, that's an aversive to her. It's an aversive to both of the wolves in this pen. And I'm like, okay, how do we do this? And it's worked, but I need to make sure it's worked for both of them. So there was another water bucket right next to it, a heated water bucket that just had standing water in it and we slowly moved it over towards here. This was a picture I snapped two weeks ago of she was drinking out of this, but I'm not sure the other wolf is. So I need, we're still in that behavior modification plan um, while we continue to use enrichment and training to empower her and get her comfortable with making change. Um, 
This is dill, one of our two ring-tailed lemurs. We've got dill and chili. I started working this past week, enter them, um, introducing them to another very young ring-tailed lemur that we named Little Gherkin. <laughs> um, the behavior, the introduction plan is put into place. We're ready to move to the next step. Um, I need to make sure that Dill and Chili are going to not attack Little Gherky. Um, so there's training happening in both sides. You can see if you can look over Dill's shoulder, her, she's got her hand grabbing the camera. Um, if you look behind her, that's Little Gherky through the screen mesh that I put up this past week. We're ready for the next step. I need to go in with them for a couple more training sessions. Right now, um, I'm standing, I'll stand on one side or the other, and I feed all three of them and watch right there at the screen. And I'm watching how all three are intera interacting. Uh, we did this a couple years ago, uh, no, a year ago, introducing dill to chili, and it worked great. But just because it worked with two does not mean it's going to work with three. So I need to be very careful um, and be ready for quick changes. And I'm putting in plans in place right now what I'm going to do in case of uh, I need to make quick decisions. Um, this is the behavior modification plan I was telling you about. Um, I presented this behavior modification issue um, and plan while I was at the Houston Parrot Festival presenting. Um, if any of you are on here that were at the Houston Parrot Festival and saw my presentation, we had a behavior concern with the highs that was turning into an abnormal repetitive behavior. I should have seen it coming, but we had a change in staff. Uh, we had low staff amount. Um, I was working seven days a week with numerous different animals. And what had started happening is the enrichment for the highs started not to have as much attention as it needed. Um, we started seeing a behavior issue with blue, the one on the right. Um, and we incorporated, and I even talked about this and showed my behavior modification plan at the Houston Parrot Festival. We had a, a behavior issue starting with blue. And I broke down what I want to see the end goal, and then we're tweaking along the way. And foraging was a huge part of this plan. So this toy that we put in should be destroyed in about five minutes by two hyacinth macaws. And they weren't touching it. So we just went way back and reshaped. And now we have shaped so much complexity in their enrichment that there is that behavior issue that we saw, say this was 100%, it's now down to about here. So we've got a little more work to do, but it's working. So they, what we did was find out what they love more than anything else. There's a couple things they love. There's a list of reinforcers, but one of them that's easy to work with was macadamia nuts. And macadamia nuts is a staple, nuts are a staple of their diet. They have to have them. So the only way they get them now is they have to forage for them. We, they weren't eating a lot of other foods. They weren't eating any other nuts. Guess what? Now they're eating all the nuts. Um, they're eating wal walnuts, almonds, pecans, in addition to their uh, macadamia nuts. So it's working. It has worked beautifully. Um, I believe that's the last slide on this one. Um, those are the things we're working on currently. And if you want to see more of what we're working on, pay attention to our workshops. When people come here for a workshop, I keep the attendance low because, and I'll design a workshop, what I think it should look like. But as soon as all the attendees get there, brrr, it changes because I focus on the individual. And if you come for a workshop with me or a day with the trainer for, with me, I sit down and put a 
functional analysis together for each individual attendee. You, if you're having concerns or problems with your bridging, with your rate of reinforcement, with your schedule of reinforcement, I'll look at if, you know, oh, you're having problems working with the nervous animal. Um, I will rearrange it and say, okay, this, you may be having an issue with a particular species. Not only will I focus on that species, but if there's another species that I'm working on with fear or behaviors labeled as aggression, I may say, let's go work with the wolves. Let's go work with the gators. Here's where you're going to fine tune your training because I always focus on the behavior. Um, and the thank you, Sylvia, very much. Um, I focus on the behavior and um, the issue at hand. So we have two workshops coming up, uh, the parrot enrichment workshop, and we also have understanding behavior through working with birds, which we don't work with just birds. Um, and we're scheduling more for this fall. Can't remember what else I have in here, but a day with the trainer is when you come individually or up to four people, but you have to know each other or be from the same organization and you are training by my side for one, two or three days. We also have our memberships, which are very popular. Um, and with that, I want to say thank you. And I will see you next Sunday for another episode of Coffee with the Critters. Um, happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Have a great week.